Um, my name is Tony Albrecht. I am a senior software engineer for Riot Games, um, which is based in LA. I work from Australia. Um, as probably as a, a more remote than Iran is, but uh, I am honoured to be in your country and in your city. Um, thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming. Um, as I said before, I have a lot to cover. Uh, I will speak fast and um, the video will be available later on um, and hopefully some slides will be av available later on. I'll also be making them uh, available um, uh, publicly and I'll be doing a series of uh, web articles based on this content as well. Uh, I'm saying this to a crowd so that I'm then forced to do it, otherwise <laughs> I won't do it. Um, so, uh, This talk is based on a talk that I did back in 2009. Um, it was... Um, an important talk at the time. It was for me to understand performance better and in giving it I, I learned a lot. Uh, I was working for Sony at the time uh, and I was investigating the performance of a simple object-oriented scene tree. Um, but it was running on uh, the uh, PlayStation 3. Um, used all the Sony tools for profiling. Uh, the PlayStation 3 had a very limited CPU. Um, it was uh, a little bit uh, had problems with branch prediction, uh, out of order um, execution, uh, the caching, there's no L3 cache, there were some serious issues with the way it performed. So the point was that the talk was valid for the PlayStation 3. Is it still valid now, eight years later, on modern hardware? Also notice, I will say cache instead of cache. Um, <laughs> my American friends tease me all the time, but yeah, so cache, cache, to me they're the same thing. Uh, this is a, um, the original demo that I wrote for the PlayStation 3. In order to get this to work, I had to port it from PlayStation 3 to PC. Um, and it took me way longer than I expected to. Uh, the original um, uh, talk, we uh, took um, the, the, the time to execute the entire frame was 19.2 milliseconds. Um, I re re reorganized the data and we had a speed up to 12.9 milliseconds. I changed the way we iterated through the hierarchy to be more linear, uh, dropped it down to 4.8 milliseconds, and then I looked at prefetching. Uh, we dropped it down to 3.3 milliseconds. Whoa. So that was a dramatic uh, improvement in performance. So, eight years later, uh, do we still need to care about the data as much? Uh, what about branching? What about prefetching? What about virtual functions? Are they all important? Can't the compiler optimize it? Compilers are clever. Why can't they do it? The compiler will not tidy your room. Okay? <laughs> it won't move your data around. It will reorganize execution as best it can. It will do what it can with what you give it. But it can't move your data around as much as it needs to. Um, so uh, most programmers write bad code. We all do it. Um, so hardware designers are very clever and they design hardware to make, make more and more complex systems to, to make our code run fast. So they have out of order execution, they have branch prediction, uh, lots of caches. Um, see? Caches, caches? Yeah, I've forgotten now. Uh, and additional cores, all to make our code run fast. This quote is amazing. Uh, the most amazing achievement of the computer science industry is its continuing cancellation of the steady and staggering gains made by the computer hardware industry. <laughs> Basically, computer hardware is steadily improving, and as it improves, we write software that makes it run slower. Okay? That's our fault, and we can do better. Companies that need to write fast software often will just buy faster computers. That's a bad thing. If you're writing for mobile or have a minimum spec machine, you can't do that. So, this is a graph of processor speeds over time. Only up to 2010, I couldn't find the recent data. This is a logarithmic graph. It's, it, processor speed has increased by 60% per year. That's amazing. Um, and memory has only increased at 10% per year. That's a dramatic difference. So we are being bottlenecked by memory access. So that's why we have caches. 
small amounts of high speed, very expensive memory. Um, the hardware will do uh, prefetching. It will look at the pattern that you access your data in and will try and predict where you will be accessing data from in the future and try and grab it before you get there. But it's not very smart. If you are jumping all over memory, it can't predict where you're going to be pulling in memory from. So I thoroughly recommend that you read up on caches, how they work, um, to understand the system better. Uh, the number of levels of caches, uh, the different types and speeds, they all depend on your platform. L1, level 1 cache is order of cycles, it's very fast. Level 2 is tens to hundreds of cycles, depending on your hardware again. Level 3 cache uh, is 40, but a miss, sorry, is what I'm talking about here. Um, level 3 hit is about 40 milliseconds to, to 100. A miss on the L3 cache where it goes to main memory is hundreds to thousands of cycles. That's a lot of processing. Um, they're fairly dumb. Um, and like I said, CPUs will try and predict where the next access will be. So how does the, the CPU prefetch? Uh, it does it linearly. It looks at where the last access was, where the current one was, and then tries to predict where the next one will be. Um, so it'll look at a uniform stride or a uniform direction. Multiple streams can be active at once, but only a limited number of them. Okay? Caches are finite in size. The number of streams that it can manage uh, is also finite. A smart programmer will take advantage of this knowledge um, and will try and produce code that, acts, that runs um, accessing memory in a linear fashion, in a predictable fashion. So, memory access is slow. What I'm saying, if what I'm saying is true, we should be able to observe and measure the performance of it. Uh, then as we change the code and data, we can measure the changes in performance. This is not an ideological argument. This is science. Many people will say, this is how you should write object-oriented code, because that's the way they were taught, and that's the way they feel it should be. Feeling has nothing to do with it. This talk, we will categorically measure the performance and show how much faster or slower things are based on the changes we make. So, I'm not going to try science. I'm going to do science. In a previous life, life I was a, a scientist before I started in games. So, okay, how are we going to measure performance? Uh, we'll use a profiler. There's a number of different types of profilers. We have instrumented profiling. Uh, we have um, sampling profilers. Um, we also have... I can't change that. Um, oops, sorry. That's my point. There it is. And we also have um, special profilers. I'll, I'll, I'll go into detail about what these are so we understand the tools that we are using. Uh, quick note of units, don't use frames per second. Okay? Bad. It's a relative measurement. For example, how much faster is 20 frames per second faster? Right? It depends. If you're going from 60 frames per second to 80 frames per second, you're looking at a 4.16 millisecond improvement per frame. If you're going from 20 frames per second to 40 frames per second, it's a 25 millisecond improvement. They're very different things. So don't use frames per second. Uh, it's a nice goal to have 60 frames per second as a goal, but that's 16.6 .6 milliseconds. It allows you to divide up your, your frame into Three milliseconds here, two milliseconds there, four milliseconds there, okay? Uh, instrumented profiling. With instrumented profiling, we are manually marking regions of interest. Uh, we record a unique ID, we record the start time and the end time of that, and we store that somewhere, and then we visualize it. Here's an example of um, what I've been using here. The FT profile FN is a little macro that I wrote. Um, eventually, I'll make this um, open source so that you can access it and use it as well for your own profiling. It's very, very simple. You can easily write one yourself. Um, that will store the string for the name, function of the name uh, in a big table and later on we'll come back and we visualize it. And now I've been using uh, Chrome tracing to visualize it. Chrome, just the standard browser. I'm assuming you have access to Chrome here? Good. Um, it's built in. It's built in. This thing is built in. It's for, it's for profiling web pages, but you can use it for your own stuff. You produce a simple JSON format file. Uh, and then you can view this type of thing. This is a zoom in, so each bar is uh, an instrumented region. So you can see here, this is a frame, this is the main loop, um, some information here, uh, some game state stuff, some rendering for the GPU, bits and pieces. This is one thread, this is another frame. This is, particle, this is actually League of Legends, by the way. Um, that's, that's the breakdown of the frame. Uh, this is particles being happening in another thread here, and this is GPU timing as well. 
Um, so we can actually look at how long things take on the GPU, and we can actually measure where the slow parts are and make them less slow. So that's free. Um, you can use that. It's fantastic. Um, instrumented profilers, the good bits about them, uh, they're fantastic for, for detecting spikes. If you're looking at average frame rates, you miss out on all the spikes and, and variations in, in uh, individual frames. Um, it's, it provides a visual sense of the performance characteristics. As humans, we like to see things. We're visual. And seeing where something is large, we can instantly say, that's slow. All right? It makes sense. It's intuitive. It gives us a top-down view of the entire frame. We can see how it breaks down. We can see the hierarchy. Uh, the bad bit is it's intrusive. You're running other code in with your code. So if you put too much stuff, too many instrumented um, sections in there, it can slow down your code. Uh, it also won't tell you which lines are slow in your code. So examples are uh, red game tools telemetry. That's a good um, uh, professional uh, instrumented profiler. It's, you pay for it, though. It's not free. Oops. Um, go back. You can write your own and visualize it. Uh, or you can use mine when I release it. There's others out there as well which are free and are very good, so um, worth looking for. Sampling profilers rapidly uh, sample the uh, program counter and they store the stack at that point. Um, it then reassembles uh, all the samples by stack and allows you to um, look at where, which lines were hit the most. Okay? Where the most hits are, that's your slowest code. Um, so slow functions get hit more often and slow lines will be hit more often. And the good thing about this, you can see the actual assembly instructions that are causing the slowdown, and that's important. It's bottom-up profiling. You see where the slow bits are, but you don't see how many times it's being called. You don't see what's calling it, so you're, you're blind from that respect. So it complements the instrumented profiling. Uh, this is an example, and it's really hard to see, and that's going to be annoying. Um, this gives us uh, basic lines of code here. Uh, this is the assembly here. So you can see the number of samples in here. This is like how much time is being spent on these individual lines. This is the breakdown of this line here that you can't read. Um, and uh, this is an example of, of this, the, the sampling. Uh, some exampling, examples of the sampling profilers are uh, Intel's VTune. That's one you pay for. But uh, AMD's Code XL is a free one. Quite good, and that's what I've been using for this example. And Very Sleepy is another free one that someone's released uh, that just connects in and, and samples your code for you and does a very good job also. But doesn't give you this assembly breakdown, just where the, the, the lines of code are slow. So there are specialized profilers as well, and they extract particular information from a process. Uh, there are CPU specific performance counters that you can pull out that'll tell you all sorts of amazing, useful, complicated information. Um, AMD and Intel profilers will provide that information for their particular chipsets. I haven't gone into much detail on that in this. So I haven't used it. Uh, there's also things like uh, uh, Cache Sim by um, Insomniac's uh, Andreas, uh, which actually simulates the cache for you. But it's only written for um, the uh, Xbox One and PS4 at the moment, I think. I had to play with it. It's great. But it also only does 64-bit um, uh, executables. And I was using 32 for this. Uh, but you can check that out there. It's pretty cool. Uh, and that's an example of the output it gives you. Uh, shows you where the, the, the lines, where the cache meshes are and how bad the code is at, that, at those places. When optimizing, you, you really need a deterministic test case. Uh, if each frame varies by 10%, how can you make a 5% improvement in performance and measure that? So having a test case which is the same each time you repeat it is very, very useful. Uh, otherwise, you need to be aware of the iterative variation. Run it a lot of times, average it out, and look at how much improvement happens over time, which is what I've done in this case. Um, another thing with compiling, use the compiler options. The, 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 the compiler guides are really smart. Okay? Um, I, I worked for a, I did, uh, had my own company, and I worked for a while optimizing people's games. I had a, a uh, client that gave me their source to speed it up. And the first thing I did was look at what compiler options they were using, changed two of them, and got a 30% speed up for their entire game. So, like, once you've got profiling in your game, have a look at the different compiler options and see how they affect your game. You might be surprised. It's an easy win. Um, experiment and profile. So, measuring performance is not enough. You need to know why something is slow. You, and when you know why, then you can address it. 
For that, you must understand your hardware. I'll leave that as an exercise to you, to you guys. Um, here's a, a, a PDF there which is on all the different major CPUs that are out at the moment and how they work, the caches, the instructions, all that information. Huge amounts of data, very, very useful. So, the test case. Oop. I hate that. Excuse me, I didn't swear. All right. Okay. The, uh, even though you can't see the text, there are hyperlinks, and I clicked on a hyperlink that wasn't there. So, basically I'm using the same code as I wrote in 2009 for the Pitfalls talk, but I'm using 50,000 objects or 50, 55,000 objects instead of 11, because the CPUs are just basically faster. So it runs at about the same time. Uh, it animates culls and renders a scene tree. Uh, I turn off rendering for the testing because the rendering is quite slow and it's not what we're interested in. Uh, I've used uh, some free third-party uh, libraries. I used Dear I Am GUI for the user interface, which was wonderful. Uh, Vector Math from Bullet, um, which was the same math library that I used on the PlayStation 3, so that was fantastic. I used Chrome Tracing for the performance visualization, and I used Code Excel from AMD for the actual sample profiling. Uh, that's what the demo looked like. Um, lots and lots of cubes, everything's rotating around everything else, and it's doing culling and, and rendering and everything. Uh, I didn't have time to put a nice shader on it and put lighting and things, but next time. This is the hardware it ran on. Uh, the, what you need to be interested in is this bit over here. We're looking at the different caches, their size, and how big each line is. 64 byte cache line. Okay? That's the quanta, that's the size of the data that gets pulled in every time you read anything from memory. You read one byte, you pull in 65 bytes. 64, sorry, not five. Um, so here's a, an instrumented frame. Um, we can see we have an update, uh, get weld bounding sphere, cull, and the render. The render is being executed, but it's not actually rendering. It's just doing a little bit of matrix multiplication and updating. Um, this is the code that we used. You can see that's the instrument, instrumentation there. Uh, calls the update, and that marks up that bit there. Uh, similarly with the get weld bounding sphere, the cull, and the render. This is the results I got. 17.5 milliseconds for a frame. This is measured over 297 frames and averaged. The good thing about this is you can look at the distribution of frames over time. So most of them are around 16, 17 milliseconds. Uh, you'll see a, basically a Gaussian distribution. This is high because there are points that fit up here that are outliers. If you don't get a nice Gaussian distribution in your, um, in your measurements, it means there's something going on which you need to break down your profile to be finer to see exactly what's happening in there. It should be a fairly uniform distribution of time. Uh, this text that you can't read is the sampling profiler output. Uh, we have uh, some different functions up here. We have, uh, I've clicked on one here, it shows me which functions are calling that function. We can look at a hierarchy here, we can see different times over here, percentages, to see the variation of uh, which bits are actually slow. Um, this is the five hottest functions for the code, and it's a matrix of, uh, multiplication. So, which kind of makes sense. Uh, multiplying matrices is hard, right? We, we did that in high school. It's complicated. So, of course, computers will do it slow. Uh, we can see the other functions that are being called here and look at their percentages. So, uh, we know that the update call, that's the first one we saw uh, on thing, was quite slow. So, let's look at that here. We can see the update from node update calls these different functions. And the main one is, again, the matrix multiply. So let's have a look at that. This is the matrix multiply here. Um, it's an overloaded mul multiply here, so it's doing vector four multiplication by a, a, another matrix. So there's other stuff happening hidden away that you can't see easily. So look at this. 96% of this function is spent returning this matrix here. Not much use, so, but we can break this down. We can actually look at the disassembly inside there. What we're looking at here is that is the function um, prologue. That's dealing with the stack, setting up the stack, uh, and this is the epilogue. That's the bit at the end that shuts down the stack usage. All right? Understanding how the compiler works and how the stack works for function calls is important. Okay? Uh, but this is most of the time in here. So what's going on in there? Okay. I couldn't put all the code there. It's four and a half pages tall. Uh, it's over a kilobyte of just code. 
it's 250 to 300 instructions just to multiply. All right. So what we're looking at here is uh, these are scalar instructions. It's the move SS takes uh, a value from memory, which is loading from here, and puts it into uh, a SIMD register. The XMMs are 128-bit registers. Um, so let's look at where the slow bit is. Ah, OK. This here, 10%. That's, that's a move. Why is a move slower than a multiply? And this is a multiply down here. That's taking no time, but this moving, just moving a bit of memory is the slow bit. The reason for this is it's a cache miss. All right? It's not telling us it's a cache miss, but we can inspect the evidence and say, this move should be fast. The reason it's slow is because it's trying to get memory from uh, main memory. So um, an L3 cache miss is of the order of a, a few hundred cycles for this, this particular hardware. Uh, a hit, like an L2 cache miss, and uh, actually finding the data we want in uh, L3 cache is about 40 cycles. The average instruction is 1 to 14 cycles long. Um, the atomics can be 30 plus cycles. But your, your instructions actually pipeline as well, so multiple of them are happening at the same time. So that cache miss of 300 cycles is probably as long as it takes to do all of the instructions. So one cache miss is the equivalent of all the different instructions put together. So let's take a step back before we go too deep. Be careful not to get caught up in micro-optimization. If you're anything like me, you see the assembly and think, right, that's slow, I can fix that. But you should really take the time, understand the big picture. Can we step back? Can we execute this less? Can we you know, um, change the algorithm that we use? Um, bigger notation, it's OK in theory, but it doesn't take into account hardware. Um, some of the uh, more cache-friendly uh, algorithms are actually faster with a larger big O notation than the lower ones. But that's why you need to measure everything so you can experiment and find out for sure. Um, let's assume for this example that my code is algorithmically perfect. It's not, okay? It's, it's broken in places, but it doesn't matter. Um, so what code are we dealing with? This, this is the code. You notice I use a dark theme because dark themes make fast code. Um, what we're doing here is taking some cubes that are geometry. Uh, I have some modifiers, which are objects that rotate other objects. We have nodes. Um, each node can contain other nodes or other objects or modifiers. It's all wonderfully object oriented. It's all pretty. Um, and it builds this hierarchy that I showed you before with the, the, all the different cubes. And then what I do with the update is actually run through, modify the modifiers, which then rotates all the bits and pieces so you can see everything spinning around everything else. Um, now, this is the object. This is the base class. You can see you've got some basic uh, functions to access stuff, a, function, uh, a method to render it. Um, you set transforms, you get transforms, you can get the bounding spheres, the world bounding spheres. It's all virtuals, and this is the data here. You've got your different transforms, your bounding spheres, a flag for visibility, uh, a flag that says whether it's dirty or not, so that we can so we don't need to update it, let's not update it. It's an optimization, right? So, we use this to build a scene tree of objects. Um, modifiers hold a vector of objects uh, and a matrix four. Uh, and a call, call to update to mo uh, will multiply all of the objects it has appointed to um, by its own transform. And that way we can move things around. This is a modifier. It inherits an object. We've got virtuals. Um, that's its uh, objects uh, vector that we use. Uh, this is the code to add an object, and this is the code to call update. It's all simple, right? Nothing complicated. So nodes, very similar. They are objects, but they um, contain a vector of objects also. So each node can, it can have nodes or it can have objects in it. A uh, little static down here is just so I can count how many things I'm actually dealing with. Uh, this is the update. Very simple. For each object that it has, call update. All right. <laughs> Back to the cache miss. Why is the matrix multiply so slow? Why is it the bottleneck? This is the function that is the, the problem. Okay? Um, this, where an object is this here. Um, this is a fair bit of data. We've got 
multiple matrices in there. Each of those is 64 bytes in size. Um, let's look at the memory layout of this of an object. Okay, now this is in Visual Studio. All right, this is your memory uh, viewer. You can see over here. Uh, it's a bit hard to read with the resolution, but this is the um, the, the transforms, the bounding spheres, the flags, um, and some pointers and stuff that the object has. So if we look at this, that's your vir virtual function pointer. That when you have a, a virtual class, it has a little table. It's a pointer to uh, an, uh, an array of pointers to functions. So it knows what to call. Um, then we have the transform matrix. We have the world transform matrix. We have a bounding sphere, which is a vector 3. But in the vector math libraries, a vector 3 is a vector 4 with one entry at the end that you don't do anything with, um, plus a radius. Same with the world bounding sphere. Then we have a Boolean. Ah, look, that's only one byte. So we're actually wasting three bytes in here. It didn't pack well. Of course, it won't pack for us. We have a pointer to a name, and we have another Boolean, the dirty flag. Then we have a pointer to the parent. And that's the base object class. Then we have the node uh, uh, standard vector. Um, the size of them is platform dependent. In this case, we're looking at 12 bytes. It has a pointer to uh, the first entry, the last entry, and a my end pointer. And that's pointing out somewhere else in memory. So if we look at the size of the cache line, the atomic chunk that we actually load every time we read anything, that's the first cache line. So if we access the object pointer, it loads in that full 64 bytes, so it pulls in part of the, the first matrix. Um, that's the second cache line, that's the third cache line. So if we're going to write M dirty, it pulls in that entire thing just to write that one byte. Okay? So if we're going to write that first matrix, it'll do be two cache misses as it has to load in the entirety of that. So it will load in that one and that one, and there's a chance that it will prefetch the third one, depending on, on hardware implementation. So, node size is 200 bytes. Object size is about 188 bytes. If we could change our packing a little bit and reduce it a little bit, but it's not going to make a huge difference. So, how can we... Well, that, this is, here's the, the update. All right? It goes through each of the objects. Uh, you'll notice here, this is actually copying the matrix from this point here. And then we're doing the multiply, and then we're setting it back. The set transform actually sets a dirty flag as well. So we're actually getting three cache misses with each set transform. But probably less because it's already grabbed that particular matrix at that point there. So this is uh, a view of all of the objects all right, that it's iterating through. And look at the memory pointers here. They're all over the place. How is the hardware supposed to predict what bit to read next? How do we remove this bottleneck? We could just render half as many, OK? Um, which might be something that you can do, but more often than not, no, you can't. You could use less memory somehow. We could pack things a little bit more, and that might help. Um, we could minimize stall by making the memory access contiguous, put stuff that we use together. Um, or we could use prefetching and actually tell the hardware, this is where we're going to look, look next. What we're going to do, though, I mean, uh, prefetching is tricky. You have to spend more time yourself working out where stuff is to tell the hardware, and by the time you've done that, you could have just loaded it in yourself. Let's work with the hardware. Let's change the memory footprint, and let's make our stuff contiguous. So how do we fix it? Uh, we'll force homogeneous, temporary coherent data to be contiguous. What that means is put all the matrices together. All right? um, put all the nodes together. Put the objects together in the order that we access them, and that way the hardware knows to prefetch and we'll do it accurately. So to do that, uh, I wrote, we can write some memory pool managers. We could overload new, but the problem with overloading new is that as somebody coming into the code base, you look at it, you think, well, I don't, it's just a new. It's not obvious that you're doing something different. I prefer to be clear rather than to be clever. So I use explicit memory managers so that people know when they look at my code, this is coming from somewhere else, and I'm doing something different with it. So here's some simple managers. All it does is each time you alloc one from the particular uh, uh, manager, it will has one big chunk of memory. It'll grab, it'll allocate one, and then the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. Um, then we can change the objects to be pointers to matrices. 
Okay? Now, you might think, well, that means I'm going to a pointer and then I'm jumping over to somewhere else, so I'm, it's two cache meters. But the thing is that those pointers are stored in objects, which are then in consecutive chunks of memory. It's loading those in anyway. That is smaller. Size of the node is 44 bytes. Uh, size of an object is 32 bytes. So you can fit two, of those, two objects in one cache line. So it's, there's no waiting for the next one. And also, because they're contiguous, the hardware can look ahead and get what you need. Um, so let's look at the memory now. Um, you see these here, these numbers? They're all contiguous, 64 bytes in lines, cache lines. Um, and then the transforms within them are also contiguous. So we're accessing these thing, things in order. We're making it easy for the hardware to predict where we're pulling in our memory from. So let's measure the performance. Um, we had 17.5 milliseconds for a frame. Now we've got 9.3. Just by changing the memory. We didn't change the functionality at all. We just changed where the memory was. All right? No functional code changes. So what we're looking at here is um, we've update, reduced the update from 5.7 milliseconds to 1.5. That's a dramatic improvement in performance just by changing the memory. And if that's all you take home from this, that's fantastic. OK? Um, the node render dropped from 3.6 to 1.49. Iteration through these things, all is faster. So where are the bottlenecks now? All right, we've made it faster, but we can make it faster. So um, looking at the instrumentation, it's still kind of uniform. There's no real big fat bits. Um, look at the sampling. The hotspot is still the matrix multiplication. OK. Um, that's what it was. It was 25% of the time. Now it's 45% of the time. All right? But that's OK, because it's faster. It's 45% of less time. All right? So basically, we haven't sped up the multiplication. We're still having cache misses in there. But everything else is faster, because it's not waiting on memory. So this is the uh, disassembly for the matrix multiply. And if we look here, that's down from 10% to 6%. So we have made it a little bit faster. But still, this is a massive chunk of code. And you notice this? That says inline. But this isn't inlined. Right? It's not being inlined because it is massive. It's a, it's a thousand bytes. So also, I've said use SIMD extensions. But that's not SIMD. Why, why isn't it SIMD? Probably it is because we know that well, it needs to have the SIM, for SIMD to be, to be working, it needs to have 16-byte uh, aligned data. Okay? Now, uh, our memory managers. Uh, in the background, are actually doing this for us. Right? I've said do 16 byte aligned. Um, so, but the hardware, the, the compiler doesn't know that, so it can't actively use, it's force in SIMD. But our library can. So what I can do is say, okay, use SSE. One little hash to find changes the include that I do from a scalar implementation of the multiplications to a SIMD one. Because I know that all of my matrices and all my vectors are aligned. So I can guarantee that it will work. So we do that, and we go from 9.5 milliseconds down to 6.2. Again, we haven't really changed any of our code. All right? So that's 17.5 down to 6.2. That's, that's a big improvement. So these two here have sped up. Um, modifier updates gone from 1.6 down to 1.3. The get world boundings here has dropped from 5.1 down to 2.3, just by changing the way we do our SIMD stuff, which is great. You know, we haven't really changed any code yet. Look at the sampling profiler. No matrix multiply. It's now inlined. OK? Awesome. Uh, the updates now dropped to number three as the most expensive. So it's kind of off the, 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 the it's not, no longer a problem. Um, so this is what the matrix multiply looks like now. Okay, we can see some SIMD instructions. Um, we can see here we are the broadcast loads from this location um, and sticks it into XM00, sorry, XMM0, um, and that's slow because again, it's a cache miss. It's trying to pull in data from somewhere else. There still are cache misses. Um, we could analyze our uh, the order that we access our matrices in uh, in more detail, um, but. There are, it's no longer the bottleneck, so we can look at other things. So let's look at virtual function overhead. This was a big problem on the PS3. Um, we have a function there called set visibility recursively, which, when called, will set all of the children to the same visibility. 
visible or invisible. Um, this is it here. Um, very simple. Uh, you'll notice I changed from using the range-based loop to uh, explicit size. Uh, that is a slight in uh, performance improvement because if you're using the range-based ones, it's actually calling size every iteration. So it's doing a subtraction in there. Um, for very tight loops, it can have an impact, um, but you, you choose yourself as to what you prefer, readability versus um, performance. Um, this is the set visibility function. This is the disassembly here. Uh, this bit here, it's ESI is the iterator, that's I. Um, so what this is doing is uh, loading in uh, data at the point that it needs, and then it's calling a function which is uh, 20 bytes away from that. So it's loading in the V table pointer, and then it's looking at the 20 bytes on is 20 divided by 4, so it's the fifth uh, function, which is set visibility recursively. So if you're looking at that, that's taking a fair bit of time, is pulling in the virtual function uh, pointer and then actually jumping to the function. It's taking the majority of the time in here. So w what if we take away all the object-orientedness, take away all the virtuals and explicitly say, I'm a node, I'll have these different types of things and I'll iterate over these things. So I did that. Um, I, there was an add node and an add object. Um, we looped over the objects and nodes separately. There was no virtuals. How fast did it go? It went slower. <laughs> so, I suspect it's due to better branch prediction in modern hardware. It's able to deal with the virtuals. Um, we're accessing things. Um, the cache friendliness of it meant that, that, that you could access the virtuals quite quickly. Um, from the assembly, it's not much worse than a function call overhead. So the thing is, um, also there's extra code in there to do looping over these things, and it probably broke the cache coherence that was implicit in there as well, because we're doing nodes and objects separately, and they may be interspersed within the actual code, so there's probably more cache misses. Uh, it's worthy of further inspection. I'm sure you can make it run faster, removing all that stuff, but I didn't have time. So assume nothing. Test everything. I like that. Question everything. Why? Um, <laughs> The good thing about doing this is that I got something wrong and I've learned something from my mistake, okay? When, when you assume something and you test it and it doesn't happen, that's great. You've learned something. You were wrong somewhere and now you're a better person for it. So prefetching. Prefetching is complicated. Uh, it's hard to get significant performances on modern hardware. Um, I've played around with it with different systems, different uh, games and different bits of uh, software before. I didn't do a lot of experimentation here. Um, but you need to be, by the time you say, this is where my data is going to be, um, it's probably too late. Um, you spend more time processing and doing that. You're better off just moving your data around. Um, just work with the hardware. So, actually, we're doing pretty good. Uh, in summary, we've gone from 17.5 milliseconds down to 6.2 just by changing the way we do our data and by changing to a SIMD implementation. Very simple changes, uh, and they're kind of under the hood. So our code hasn't changed, nothing functional has changed. So it's like coming along and optimizing somebody else's code without changing it, which is, which is great. No functional changes. We've changed the memory layout, dropped down to 9.5 milliseconds, dramatic improvement in performance. Turn on SIMD use. We're using the hardware, it has SIMD. All of the modern CPUs have some form of SIMD. It's worth learning how to use it. Um, it is much faster. We're dealing with four floats at once. It has a deep pipeline. It runs on a different part of the processor. So all this stuff can be happening at the same time and you can get some really good performance improvements if you are careful about the way you lay out your data and that you are careful about um, what SIMD functions you're using. We could go even faster. In the original 2009 talk, I took out all the virtual stuff and, I f and all the hierarchy stuff and flattened it out. It's kind of abusing the problem in that it's no longer as extensible as it was before. And I've, I've customized uh, a solution to uh, a very specific problem, which is if you're writing a game, you have very specific problems. You control how you access, the, uh, how, how you uh, run the code and, and how you build up your scenes for your games and whatnot. You can put them in a very specific format 
that matches exactly how you want to optimize your, how you want to run the code. So it allows you to take advantage of it. So you can hard code stuff, and I advise that you do. You know, putting stuff in the right places when you load it in means that you can speed things up dramatically. Um, so yeah, the original stuff I had, lots of raw pointers, lots of raw stuff everywhere. It was at the cost of flexibility, and it was at the cost of readability. Okay, now readability is important. Um, you will come back into your code at some stage in the future. Um, I'm working on a code base that's been around for quite a while, and I'm dealing with code written by people a long time ago. Um, so I always make sure that when I change code, I make it better, so that it's clearer, uh, hopefully faster, um, so that when I come back to it in the future, I'm not going to hate past me. So the optimization process, first stage, understand your problem. Okay? You can't optimize it if you don't understand it. You can't just look at a sampling profile and say, that line's slow, fix that line. Understand the whole problem. Okay? Um, profile it, understand where the problems really are. Is there a better algorithm that we can use? Problems change over time. Um, some code was written to solve a particular problem. It's been there for a while. The problem that it solved is now subtly different, but the code is the same. So if you understand the problem, you can then say, oh, okay, we need to solve this in a different way. We can make other assumptions. We can improve our code um, by doing it a different way. It doesn't mean the original implementation was bad or that the original programmer was an idiot. It means that things evolve over time, and you can take advantage of that, especially towards the end of the game where you've locked down how you want to build the things. You can then say, okay, this is going to stay like this. I can do this. I can make these assumptions. Um, three. Can you do this thing less? Do we need 55,000 objects? Can we do it with 25,000 objects? We split it up by a factor of two. Um, what about doing things in parallel? Can we divide this up and do it in parallel? Or can we do it every other frame? Do we need to animate all of the objects every single frame? Can we disperse it over multiple frames? If we're running some AI, do we need to update every 16 milliseconds? Can we update every 50 milliseconds? Okay. Understand your data access patterns. It's very important that you look at how you access the data. This is the key thing that will make your code run slow. Um, if you can look at where your memory is coming from, actually trace it out, step through the code, see where it's coming from, um, you can take advantage of that. And you can massage it back into a, a way that ensures that things are being run in order so that the hardware can make the most of your code. Um, so Optimize for temporal coherence. Optimize for data being accessed in order. Okay. Um, the side effect of doing this, optimization for the coherence and putting contiguous data together, is that it makes it easier to parallelize. Because the problems with race conditions is when two threads are accessing the same data. If your data is in a nice big flat array, you can put half of it on that thread, the other half on that thread, and there's no synchronization until you've finished. It makes it so much easier. Once you've done all that, then you can look at instruction level optimization. But rarely do you need to go that low. And when you do, you end up producing code which is very brittle, um, that does exactly one thing. There are times and places where you need to do that, but you need to pick and choose them very carefully. So when optimizing, aim for simplicity. The idea is to make the code simpler. If it's simpler to read and understand, it's simpler to make fast. Um, it makes it simple to understand, it makes it simple to maintain. You need to weigh up the costs of complex, highly optimized code. Like I said before, it can be brittle and costly to maintain. It will often be throwaway, but it is often necessary. So this was called pitfalls of object-oriented programming. I've not really dealt with pitfalls. I've dealt with optimizing your cache and memory layout. So a, a quick delve into here. Encapsulation, building your objects around logic and function versus data around function. This is the tree that does this stuff. And here's another tree that does this stuff. That works and conceptually match, uh, works with the way we think about objects in the real world. But the computer is not the real world. The computer is a computer that is designed to work in a certain way. If you can think about your problem in terms of data and streams of data, you can produce much faster code. It's a bit of a change in the way that we're taught to think about object-oriented programming. But do you want speed or do you want 
some nice objects that match the way you think about things. There's a case for both. Um, so object-oriented code, object-oriented uh, design used with foresight can be fast, simple, and maintainable. If you're not caring about it, you can produce slow, complex, unmaintainable code. And it's also often unoptimizable without a complete rewrite. And when you find out that, it's generally towards the end of the life cycle of the game, and it's too late. There's too much to change, and it's too risky. Design with this in mind when you're building your systems. So the language is not your platform. You are not building something to run in C++ or any language. Uh, you're building something to run on some hardware. Okay? Understanding how that hardware works. If you're using Unity, for example, you're using C Sharp. Your platform is Unity to a certain extent. Understanding how it works with your code will give you benefits. You know? If you had more transparency into how Unity worked itself, then you could do more things with it too. Or just talk to this guy. Um, you're building something to run on some particular hardware. All right? Your language is an abstraction of that hardware. And as an abstraction, it means that you are distanced from it a little. So if you just treat the language as your platform, you can be doing things which are horrible on the hardware. If you need it to run fast, build it with the hardware in mind. That's the end. Thank you. Um, any questions? Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, fast code can be readable too, and you should strive to produce readable fast code. But there are times where I, I know most AI that I've ever seen is horrible as far as performance is concerned, but it needs to be that way in order to get the layers of abstraction you need in order to produce the complex behaviors that you want. But you are then physically limited by how many uh, AI entities you can deal with. So at some point in the future, if you keep working on that and you keep growing the number of uh, uh, entities you need to deal with, you may need to refactor the way you do things once you understand how you want to do things. But both are valid. And you, it is a trade-off between absolute flexibility from a, a logic and design point of view versus performance. And that's something you need to weigh up for your particular circumstance. Yes? Now with, with this great hardware that we have, mm -hmm. do we need to care about this thing to speed up? <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. We have fantastic hardware. You write code without thinking about it, and somebody else thinks about it, their code runs twice as fast, comfortably. If they work hard, it's 10 times as fast. So their game will have 10 times more objects, 10 times more features. That's 10 times. You know, it is still something you need to consider. All right? Yeah. Um, it depends on the, the problem. If it's a big problem that I need to consider the entire design phase of, I will consider memory at that point. Because I have an intuitive feel now as to what will work and what won't. So I will design with that in, in, in place. Um, if you're not sure, write it. Make it work. Then profile it. Profiling should be an integral part of your development process. You should know how long, how much slower your new code is. If you change something, is it, is it faster or is it slower? If it's slower, how much slower? Is that okay? Do you have budgets for performance for your game? You know, th these are things you need to consider. Um, again, if you're not sure, write it, test it. And if it's fast enough, don't worry about it. Okay? It, it, it's fast enough, just go with it. If it is horribly slow, you think, okay, I need to understand why this is slow, and then I'll do it a different way. Because I need to have 4,000 fighting humans on screen at once, so I need to change the way I'm doing things. Okay? I, I've worked on a, a game, uh, a game optimization, which was they needed 50 cyclists on screen at once, all animating on a console. And it was beautifully object-oriented, and there was no way you could speed it up. Because it would have meant pulling the whole thing apart and rebuilding it in a very different way. I mean, it was very nice code, but it was just unoptimizable. And that was too late. So they had to reduce the number of cyclists. Actually, I don't even know, don't even know if they released the game in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, any more? Sorry. Yes. 
اوکی Just okay. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, towards the end, uh, you said that uh, uh, thinking in a, a logic, thinking in a logical, in logics and functions way, or thinking in data streams. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a simple example? Um, in the case that I showed, it was it was a functional design around objects. There is objects, and I have objects that contain objects, and objects that do things to objects. Um, changing that to be streams, uh, an object, make, make a component-based architecture is a good example, where you have uh, an object, and it has a position or an orientation component, and that is stored somewhere else in a big, flat array of positions, and it may have a bounding box, which defines its, its size within the world. Again, it lives in another stream. So theoretically, you can then process a stream of bounding boxes without worrying about what they actually correspond to, to determine whether they're visible or not. You don't care about the object, you just go through the bounding boxes. Um, so treating data as a, uh, a stream of information rather than individual things that do things, it is something that has this, and this is managed by something else. Uh, it's, it can be a challenge. But um, I've seen some really good component-based architectures that, that, that do that. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes? Uh, can I ask a question about League of Legends? It's something. About which, sorry? About League of Legends. That uh, if I can answer it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, League of Legends is a pretty old game. Yes. I just want to know how many times the engine completely changed. I mean, <laughs> it's good question. And there's a story in that. I'm actually working um, uh, on the render strike team. I'm actually rebuilding the renderer at the moment. Um, this is a game that has evolved over time. Okay? It started off with one code base doing one thing, and it has been constantly changing. Every two weeks, we release a new version with new features, new code, new data, new assets. Um, we've ended up with seven renderers okay, that do different things in different levels. And so uh, my job has been to, uh, with a team that I'm working with, is to reduce that to one renderer that does all the stuff the others do and then gives us one place to improve things and make things better and better. Um, optimizing code like League of Legends is a challenge because it is constantly changing, but it's about putting in place um, uh, systems that make it uh, easy for other programmers to use in the correct way. Um, so, uh, what's a good example there? Um, I've kind of lost track of what the original question was as well. <laughs> How many times you changed the engine? Uh, well, it's, we've built on top of it. Okay? It's, it's, it's the core engine. Some of the original code is still there. So, part of what I'm doing, I was on another team called Cuts, which is called Clean Up the Stuff. And we went through and removed all the bad stuff, all the old things that were no longer used, um, and, and threw them away where possible. There are still bits and pieces of the original code in there. Um, if it's not broken, you don't mess with it. Okay? Um, but because anything you fiddle, the thing with League of Legends with 100 million players playing this thing per month, is that if anything can go wrong, it will. I've had a one line change of code that's broken on you know, a small percentage, but still thousands of players' machines. Um, it's a very interesting code base to work within. But we are constantly rebuilding it. We're constantly adding in new things. We're constantly changing the way we do things and improving it and making it easier for our content generators to produce new champions and new levels and, and new game content. Um, so it's not that we have rewritten it. It's not do everything at once. It's bits and pieces all the time. It's constantly evolving and changing. It's a, it's a real challenge and it's a lot of fun. I think we're getting towards the end. We done? Okay, if you have any questions, please come talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to, to talk to you all. And once again, thank you for inviting me to your, your country to talk. Thank you. <laughs>